What's up, Spidey fans? It's the man whose ring runs on fanboy energy. It is the Emerald Enthusiast, back with another comic book review. This time, I'll be taking a look at the facsimile edition of Marvel's The Amazing Spider-Man number 300, the first appearance of Venom. This story is incredibly significant for me. I bought an original copy off of a spinner rack in a 7-Eleven in 1988, and it was one of those moments that was life-changing. I'll talk more about that later in the video, but for now, let's take a look at some of the details of this comic. Although this is very similar in appearance to the original release, you will not mistake this for a copy from 1988. There are some differences. For instance, the original was cover priced at $1.50 and this one is cover priced at $6.99. Also note the Marvel logo in the bottom right hand corner of the comic. That was not present on the original cover in 1988. Now let's have a look at the interior. And the paper is similar to the newsprint type of paper that was used in 1988. Although this paper feels like it's slightly higher quality. This image of Mary Jane really grabbed my attention. She had been menaced by Venom in the previous issue and you can see the terror on her face. This was a lot darker than the comics that I had read up until that point in my life. You can see the concern on Peter's face here. And then the next page starts to give us an idea of who Venom is. The artwork by Todd McFarlane in this issue is astounding as you can see. And we start to see that this is some personal issue between Eddie Brock and Peter Parker. Here we see Peter suffering insomnia because he realizes that he's up against his old costume. And here we see a flashback to when Peter first started wearing the black costume. And we see the nature of the symbiote here. These were very important at the time because we didn't have the internet to be able to look up any character that we wanted. And as you can see, Peter and Mary Jane were in a mature relationship. This was a marriage, not the usual high school kind of will they or won't they storyline. And I found that very interesting. I had never seen anything like Todd McFarlane's art at that point in my life. And even a simple panel like this of characters sitting around a table and talking was very attention grabbing due to his innovative style. One of the things that struck me about Venom was that he was a complex character. Here we see him confronted by a cop and he kills this officer in a horrific scene where he suffocates him with the symbiote. But we also see that he's conflicted about what he's doing. He never wavers in his quest for revenge, but hurting other people in the process is something that begins to weigh on his conscience. Here we see the initial clash between Venom and Spider-Man, and we get to see Eddie Brock's backstory. Brock didn't set out to be a villain. He just wanted the life of a reporter. But when he wrote a story based on a fraudulent confession, and Spider-Man exposed this, Eddie was fired, and his life began a downward spiral. We learn all of this while Spider-Man is reaching for his sonic gun to help him deal with the symbiote. Here we see that Eddie tried to deal with his stress and depression by lifting weights, but it was insufficient to deal with his displaced anger. In this top panel, we see that he actually became suicidal, and I felt some sympathy for him. But when Eddie's pain became one with the scorned symbiote, it created a truly dangerous villain. Here we see Venom's wacky and morbid sense of humor as he dresses as a priest during an attempt to kill Spider-Man. This was one of the reasons that the character was so popular in the 90s. 
And it's a key component to the movie adaptation of Venom as well. David Michelinie's writing was brilliant here. One of the things that always made Venom such an intriguing villain is the fact that Peter couldn't rely on his abilities alone to beat Venom since Venom had all of Spider-Man's abilities and he was stronger. So Peter always had to be resourceful. Here Spider-Man is able to force the symbiote to use up so much of itself that Venom falls from atop of Our Lady of Saints and is rendered unconscious. When I saw that Venom survived this issue, I couldn't wait for him to return. I also really liked Thing's design at the time, in particular the way that Todd McFarlane drew him. I think that's a really cool look. And here we see the psychological toll that this took on Mary Jane from being threatened in her own home. And Peter goes back to wearing the red and blue costume because the black and white one reminds her of being menaced by Venom. And the issue closes with this absolutely gorgeous image of Spider-Man and it marks a new era for the Web Slinger. It's been so long that I don't remember what happened to my original copy of Amazing Spider-Man 300. I do remember that the comic wasn't in good condition because I read it so many times. This was the issue that transformed a childhood interest into a lifelong hobby. It felt darker, more mature, and it hit me in a way that felt more realistic. After this, I began investigating other comic book offerings, and I found that there were plenty of stories out there that didn't feel too child-centric. After reading this issue, I never really lost touch with the comic book world again. Even at various points in my life when I was busy with school, or work, or money was tight, I would always make sure to go back to comics whenever I had the chance. And now as a man well into middle age, I still collect comics, I make videos about comics and comic book products, and I podcast about comics. Yet I can trace all of this back to being a teenager in a church pew reading this story before the service. I know that I have forgotten some of the experiences that I've had in my life over the past 35 years, but I never forgot the moment when I read this story. And even though I have this story in a couple of collected editions, I was still thrilled to buy this facsimile. David Michelinie and Todd McFarlane really caught lightning in a bottle with this issue. And there was something magical about holding this story in my hands again as a single issue comic. If you don't have the money to buy an original Amazing Spider-Man 300, and even raw copies in poor condition are somewhat pricey, then I would highly recommend that you pick up this facsimile. There's also a foil edition of this comic, and I'm going to try to track that down. If you decide to add either one of these to your collection, I think that you'll be very pleased. And I hope that you enjoyed this video. If so, please like and subscribe. And please, tell all of your friends about this channel. I would certainly appreciate it. And I'll be back with more comic book related content soon. But until we meet again, this has been the Emerald Enthusiast. And thanks for watching.